Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon of the Chabad House of Delmar. We have a very special guest with us today. This is Rachel or Rachel of Weitz. She's our expert on Yiddish. Welcome to the Jewish View. Shalom Aleichem. It's nice to be here. Very good. You know, Yiddish or sometimes people call it the Jewish language. You'll hear it in Jewish. You know, tell us what it is, where the language came from, the origins. And tell us about it before we talk about the language itself. Well, Yiddish is a Jewish language uh, that evolved uh, in the Golos, in the diaspora, uh, just like any other uh, uh, Jewish uh, language that evolved in the diaspora. And one of the famous ones is, of course, uh, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, and uh, so forth. Uh, the Yiddish evolved in uh, Europe, um, probably around Elizabeth's Lorraine area. Uh, you have to remember that Second Temple, where by the Romans they brought us to that area, and this is where was the first exposure of uh, Jews to the European uh, languages. Now you have to remember when a person moved from one place to another, he carries with him what he is which means speaking uh, Hebrew and a lot of uh, Aramaic, which was the lingua franca of the area uh, at the time. And uh, coming to Europe, um, they preserved, thank goodness for that, uh, the liturgy and continued to be Jewish uh, uh, despite the exposure to the local influences. One of the amazing things that I, I think are special that a Jew was uh, responsible to his faith by himself. So the idea of you shall tell your son re that every father is in charge of his children, I think added to that also that uh, reading from the Torah and the Talmud uh, continued to be in Hebrew and Aramaic and of course the, the prayer. So this is the core of all Jewish uh, languages as they evolved in the diaspora and added to it any local influence, which were in the beginning the Roman languages um, uh, and then uh, the Germanic languages, which added, I would say, quite a big uh, component, um, about 30 to 40 percent. It depends on uh, who spoke the language because the more literate one, the one who went to the yeshiva, the, the higher education, of course, had more Hebrew and Aramaic component in it um, than the one who did not. Um, so, uh, mainly the Yiddish is a German language. I it's mean, a Germanic, it excuse me? I mean, mainly it's German, isn't it? I mean, if you would look at the words and the grammatical structure. Okay, first of all, I would say Middle Evil German. Uh, most of the roots are uh, Germanic. It's, it's, it's considered a Germanic language. However, uh, its component is made from uh, what is called the Loishan Koidish, uh, which is mainly Aramaic and the Hebrew, uh, and then the Germanic roots. When the Jews were expelled uh, toward the eastern uh, land of uh, Europe, they took with them those medieval uh, German uh, verbs and brought it to their new environment where the Slavic influence uh, 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 started to affect the, uh, the language. Uh, so uh, I went once to, just to give you an example, I went once to a convention for Yiddish and I met a, I met a professor for the German language and I was curious and I asked him what are you doing here? Why here? And he said, well, if I want to research the medieval German roots, I, it's a good idea to go to Yiddish because they were kind of uh, frozen in time because the Jews moved on and took with them uh, those verbs uh, as opposed to the evolving modern German language w who continued to develop itself just like any other uh, mm -hmm. language. Very interesting. <laughs> so it's like more of a, like a sh for English would be Shakespeare you know, if people wanted to yes. learn about what, how they speak. And yeah. That's interesting. I didn't yeah. know that. Well, the way I see it, Yiddish is a relatively young language. It's about uh, 1,000 years old, and uh, it is a fusion language just like any other language, like English and, and so forth. Uh, my personal way of looking at that is because it is such a young language, there is enough of a recorded history, so we know where the other influences came from to, to Yiddish, and we can almost dissect it to small parts, uh, as opposed to 
old languages, uh, it's a little bit harder because we don't have enough uh, historic he evidence to show where the other languages uh, came from. We can go back to Babel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we know they say there's an ancient uh, language that um, um, words travel from one language to another and existed in them. One of the famous one is Ain. Ain in Hebrew is I in English. Listen, I Ain Oig in Yiddish, and 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 so forth. So uh, and then we have Ain uh, Hure, you know, the evil eye, which kind of preserved the, the Hebrew way, adding to it the European uh, pronunciation. Um, and this is a word that exists in many, many uh, languages, Arabic, Ain, and so forth. Very interesting, but really it picked up more German, and the Jewish people moved on to Poland and Russia, but mm -hmm. there's a little influences of a lot of languages. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I don't know Polish and I don't know well, Russian, but... Okay, let me uh, start uh, with what is close to my heart, and I think that will explain it a little bit. Uh, Yesterday, just from all emails, before I went to bed, I got an email about the transportation of Jews from the Karpat. Uh, Karpat Karusk was the area which was a part of what used to be called Czechoslovakia. Today is the Slovakian Slo mountains. Exactly. And this is where my mother was from. And they did um, an excellent uh, recording, the Nazis, you know, Yimach uh, Shemam, of, of, of the people who are being gathered together to go to Auschwitz, and we all know what was their fate. And uh, in the most stupid way, I'm trying to recognize, you know, maybe I'll see my grandmother, then I'm thinking, I don't know how she looked like at that time. We have only one photo that remained. And I know my mother was there in the crowd, my, her sisters, the brother that was murdered, the grandfather, you know, that was there, the Bube and the Zayde, as we call it in, in Yiddish. And it made me think about what we're going to do today, talking about my uh, past. And really, it took me f some time to realize that uh, I'm carrying with me the Yiddish of the grandparents I never had both of the Polish side and the Slovakian uh, side. And this is how my life went. I could never get confused between which side of the family am I meeting now. Let's say I would be in Israel, and you can hear by my accent, I am a Sabra born in Israel. Uh, if I would meet a, a, a family or a friend of the family from a, a, a Poland, uh, they will refer to me Ruchale or Rochel, as you called me. If it would be someone from the Slovak area with the Hungarian influence, I would be called Ruchale. Yeah. So you can immediately hear the different pronunciation and the local influence. There were different dialects that evolved, and uh, uh, first of all, I want to say the geographic dimension of Europe and the geographic dimension of the Jewish way of looking at Europe was not exactly matching. And uh, I think for the mischa, for the trade, uh, Jews uh, developed these zones, like uh, France was called Sarfat, uh, Spain was Sepharad, uh, Ashkenaz was a Germanic area, and so forth. And there were Jews from Spain who were also in Ashkenaz, but it evolved to be what we recognize today as uh, Ashkenaz. And uh, so there were a few big ones that evolved, uh, and that's the uh, Litvakisha Yiddish the, from Lithuania area, the Ukraine, which is known as the Galicianer, and then the Polish one, and then the one I just mentioned that is more the uh, uh, Slovak area, the Hungarian-speaking uh, Jews. And each area had its own uh, uh, a, a, a small dialect. It all depends on how uh, the people were in contact with each other. So you can say sub, sub dialects. Uh, it was much more versatile than we know today. Unfortunately, the war uh, did kill the language together with the, the people. Uh, and um, in Europe, out of those, well, maybe it's a six million. Jews we know that perished. Um, Yiddish was totally, how many would you say, I mean, I don't know how many Jews, like seven, eight, I think, million Jews were in Europe before the war. 
uh, what percentage uh, talked Yiddish, the Yiddish language? Practically everybody was just, everybody spoke Yiddish? You're talking before the war? Yeah, before the before war. Before the war, Yiddish uh, became uh, very, very uh, dominant. Uh, Yiddish was considered the everyday uh, language among the Jews once they settled in the Stetlach of Eastern uh, Europe. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's the Western Yiddish, which is more the German area. Uh, I happened to meet in uh, Bar Mitzvah. I went to uh, Paris a few years ago with Elsass Lorrainians, <laughs> Jews, mm -hmm. who spoke their Yiddish. Like a French Yiddish? It's, kind of it's, 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 uh, it's more, uh, it's of course a French influence, Germanic, and they pronounce it a little bit differently, the same words, you know, like Israeli, Yiddish, I would say there's a lot more words from Hebrew, and it's, it's a yeah. natural uh, evolution, but that was quite interesting to speak with them. It was the only language we could share. I mean, I mm -hmm. speak very little uh, French. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I was going, what did you ask, I'm sorry? Well, I just, uh, how many Jews spoke Yiddish? That's okay, so really, Yiddish I mean, became... It was universal, really, you know, because I know the German Jews before the war, they, the Germans, the modern German Jews, didn't, uh, you know, want to be too Jewish looking, so they didn't, they uh, spoke just German. Right. What happened with the German Jews, it's a little bit different than the rest of the Jews because I can say, in general, a... a that they had the local influence of the German culture. And also, once the Haskalah came, um, they looked down at Yiddish and kind of stayed away with that. And they said, oh, it's not really. It's like a corrupted German or jargon. Even today, sometimes you hear people say that, ah, you're talking a jargon, which is really uh, not true and not correct uh, to say. I'm so, uh, unfortunately, this is like the remnants of something very negative that evolved, uh, which I wish it didn't, but that's how it happened. And a, a lot of that led to a local national identity of the German Jews, uh, which fell apart, of course, in the Holocaust, but also uh, evolving into developing the modern uh, Hebrew language as we know it uh, today. Really, what you see, the, the, the majority of Yiddish development is more into the Slavic zones, Eastern uh, Europe. And if you, if you look at the history of Yiddish, it's uh, quite interesting because uh, Yiddish was the everyday language. Uh, and um, it was not a mechubed, it was not uh, respectful of men, for example, to, to, to be caught reading in uh, Yiddish which became more uh, vast uh, when, once the print was invented and started to be used. And uh, since uh, the Jewish women uh, uh, were not encouraged to go to higher uh, Jewish education, they are the one that their main language was Yiddish, there was a whole literature that was developed that was geared toward them. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about a, a literature that was a, a translation, a loose translation of a, a local European a romances, a, a, which were converted to the Jewish world. Just translated or just pure translations? No, or? no, no, that's what I'm saying. Really? They made it Jewish. For example, if she prayed to Maria, in the Jewish story, she prayed to God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, they made it Jewish, and a lot of times there was a lot of cynicism built into that, you know. Uh, in the, they had a canning, they had a king, uh, the Jewish king maybe was uh, David Amelech, you know, yeah. uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, that was one thing that evolved. And also in time, uh, and, and part of it has to do, which I thought is very, very interesting, was that uh, the Christian people, the, the scholars, some of them took it as an assignment to reach out into uh, the Jewish woman and uh, what in Yiddish is called Poshet uh, the simple Jew uh, who didn't get to go to the higher education because this was really a minority elite that ended up being able to go to higher education. Most of the Jews had to survive the everyday life and uh, a lot of them had hardship, you know. So 
they try to reach out to the simple Jew and to the Jewish woman and try to convert them into Christianity. Yiddish was used to that, and it's quite amazing mm -hmm. with the invention of the print. So the counter reaction to that is, oi, give out, what are we doing? We're yeah. losing our people, you know, the rabbis and so forth. So they started developing a, a, a whole literature for women, the chines, and all kind of tzena uh, ruena, uh, 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 I'm not saying it in the Yiddish pronunciation, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and so forth, uh, which are very famous today, a uh, sidur in Yiddish, which was uh, meant for, for uh, the Jewish uh, uh, women and the simple man, which tried not to read in the street because then he's identifying himself as not belonging to the elite. elite. Uh, let me just show you, oh, sure. for example, oh, I was going to say, um, as you can see, the, the print that was chosen is a little bit different from the Torah script. This is more round and uh, it really to make a difference. It's the same thing like uh, what is known as Ketav Rashi, uh, which was different from the Loishon Koidish. You mm. shouldn't mix the two. So here you have the interpretation to the Torah uh, in the Yiddish uh, language, uh, which was used in purpose like that, and this is the same uh, print that was chosen uh, uh, to uh, the romances of for the Jewish women and so forth. It, it evolved into a whole uh, oh, a kind of literature. Uh, 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 not only literature, uh, uh, something that you identify as interpretation. Or, it, or 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 uh, Yiddish books, as opposed to the Torah, and the print was chosen to be uh, different, and it's quite clear uh, why. I think in the beginning they even called it uh, Weiberstich, really? no, if I remember no. the vocabulary correctly. Yeah, uh, this is how strong was the the influence. Um, so really the Yiddish literature was built up a little bit later even because just to yeah. bring it out to the masses so people would be able to read. Absolutely. Uh, it, it started, as I said, as a, a need uh, to uh, bring the, the, the literature, the correct literature, into the Yiddish world. Uh, and then it started evolving in different uh, ways. If you look at the at, at Yiddish in general, today we associate it with the ultra-orthodox, with the Hasidim. Uh, you say Yiddish, you think religious people. But really, we have to remember that it was a more uh, a, a language that really belonged to everyone, and different groups of people used it in their, uh, in, in their ways. Uh, I was thinking that actually it's more than that because uh, if you look at uh, what Russia did with the Jews, uh, they try to distance the Jews from the land of Israel. So how do you do that? You say to them, well, we will recognize you as a minority and as a minority you can have your language, Yiddish. They even tried in, uh, uh, in Birobidjan, they tried even to erase all connection to Hebrew by writing Yiddish as it is sounded. Because in Yiddish, uh, if a word it comes from the Lotion Koidish, from Hebrew and Aramaic, it is being spelled exactly as it is in Hebrew or Aramaic to preserve mm -hmm. the connection and the Jewish identity. Uh, and they tried to erase it. They, uh, instead of uh, sh uh, uh, writing, for example, Emet, which will be Aleph, Mem, Taf, and you're supposed to know how to say it, Emes, yes. or Shabbos, Shabbat, mm -hmm. Shin Betaf, in Yiddish we say Shabbos, but we write Shin Betaf like it is in Hebrew. They say, no, we can uh, write it the way it is sounding. And you'll find a humongous amount of literature uh, that was written this way in, uh, in Russia. So here we have Yiddish that you know, was I used have my own personal thing because you know, a lot of Russian Jews came in 1978, 1990, especially when it was liberated. So I talked to a lot of Russian Jews and the older Jews. Really, it's interesting that on a side note that even the younger Russians 
knew a little bit more Yiddish than their counterpart in America. You know, you talk to a 30-year-old Russian that came out and they knew some Yiddish, and you go to like a 20, 30-year-old American off the street, American Jew, and they hardly know anything. So it was interesting that Russia kept it up. But then she wrote something out for me. We, I needed something, and I couldn't read it. You're right. It was, where do you spell this word? How do you spell this? You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I couldn't get the spelling straight. You know, I had to, like, decode it, even though I knew how to, sp you know, spell and write Yiddish. But, and then, you know, someone explained that to well, me. Well, yeah, yes. they, they tried uh, really uh, to say in a blunt way to brainwash uh, the Jews just like anybody else to become a loyal uh, Russian citizens uh, under the communistic uh, uh, ideology. And they tried to uh, make the kids really rebel against their parents. Uh, God is not good. Uh, circumcision is not good. The bris is evil. It's a cruel uh, uh, custom. Uh, and so forth, and uh, the funny thing is they develop a whole curriculum, a whole educational system uh, to steer away the Jews from Judaism, Zionism, Israel, uh, but actually they, they couldn't succeed. They, they tried to brainwash them against the Cheder and so forth, uh, against Pesach, Passover, uh, any uh, Anything that has to do with the Jewish identity, uh, they try to erase it. But they allow the Jews, as a, minor a recognized minority, that the chosen language was Yiddish, to teach in Yiddish. So it's like hipcha <laughs> mistabra. Yeah. They ended up strengthening the Jewish identity by keeping their language. Because even if you, they tried to erase, and there were uh, Russian Jews who were loyal communists who, who, who devoted their time to do that, and uh, they, they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed. Uh, thank goodness for that. Uh, and and uh, actually, by staying in Yiddish, it helped the Jews not to be completely brainwashed, not to say that they didn't, Probably they were. Similar and uh, it, it led to assimilation. Then they, they got away from that, you know, and uh, uh, the, uh, you know probably better than me how many Jews uh, came only knowing that they're Jewish and not uh, really any connection to anything from their uh, It's also heritage, interesting, but know. a lot of them would, you know, the American Jews didn't know Yiddish so well, and they thought, well, oh, they're not the, Jewish, you know, right, oh, right, you know, right. they're not. They don't speak Yiddish, so I mean, they go to shul, so they go to synagogue. I mean, they're Jewish, right, so right. you don't speak Yiddish. But. Exactly. But uh, what I was going to say, so this is one way of looking at that. And then the the Jewish people, uh, when they started developing the Zionistic idea, they also got away, and probably uh, quite a lot with the Russian communistic influence, uh, really steering the Jews away from religion and Yiddish, building a new nation in Israel, uh, which led, unfortunately, uh, you're bringing a topic which uh, I, I would like to touch in, in a, a different way a little bit, a little wider than the American Jewish history. Of course, as we all know, a Yiddish uh, was uh, killed, murdered, together with all of our uh, 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 the victim of the Holocaust, the Jewish people who were killed uh, in the Holocaust. So what happened next is we have the state of Israel and we have other countries where Jews uh, fled to. Actually, the, the spread of Yiddish, I can say, started with a big wave of uh, immigration uh, that started, the, uh, I think, 1880 to 1920s. And Really, it helped to spread Yiddish to other places, including uh, in the United States. I mean, think about the poetry that was read, uh, written around uh, the sweatshops in the Lower East Side. Yiddish uh, did very well in America in the beginning. Uh, there were lots of uh, newspapers the and, and the Forward and the Algemeiner. And by the way, today you can go online and read it in Yiddish and English. Mm -hmm. Either way. Uh, uh, but then came uh, this idea in, in America that uh, uh, kind of steered away the Jews from, uh, uh, from Yiddish uh, and Hebrew or any uh, <laughs> Jewish uh, language. Uh, there were Sephardic Jews in America. I'm sure it's the same history for them. The idea of the melting pot. 
that uh, said we are all one nation and, and, and let's forget uh, what was in the past was in the past. Anyway, it wasn't very good in Europe, so why do we need that? And kind of voluntarily uh, erasing their identity, um, which today is changing because I had uh, students uh, when I taught at uh, SUNY Albany uh, that were very upset. They say to me, my booby and my Zayda never spoke Yiddish to me, only sometimes when they didn't want me to understand. <laughs> That's the typical thing you'll get. Or uh, just to, to give me fond names, like Azisi uh, Ingele, Asheine Meidele, expressions, you know, or dishes, of course.